I know every time you click on one of my videos, you're like, I hope this bitch looks better today. And then I don't. So for that, I'm sorry. I also am sick of me and my raggedy appearance, but I don't know what to do about it, okay? Hey, hi, hello, welcome or welcome back to my channel. My name is Jess and I don't know if you can see, here is Nigel. And welcome to another installment of Book Community where I try to keep you abreast of the goings on in the bookish community. So I totally forgot to mention this, but on Wednesday, January 6th at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I am going live on Bethany's channel. Um, that's Beautifully Bookish Bethany. I'll have it linked in the description below, but I'm going live with Bethany and with Izzy from Happy For Now. And we are gonna talk about the wild year we had in 2020, go through some of the bookish drama um, to recap all of the messiness. And so again, that's on Bethany's channel. It'll be linked down below and it is January 6th, so that's Wednesday. Of course, it'll be up to watch after that. But we would love if you would come join us live because we would love to interact, get questions, get feedback to all the nonsense that we survived in 2020. So be there or be there later. I'm not going to say B-square. Okay, thank you. Bye. So I do have a few, I don't want to say announcements, but things I want to say before I get into this week. So if you don't want to hear that, I understand. I have timestamps in the description if you just want to skip ahead. But first, um, Nigel, I know you're like, why is he back in a cone? It has nothing to do with his little snip snip surgery. He's perfectly healed from that. But since we got him as a puppy, he's had allergies. And I've gone back and forth with the vets about this. And at first they were like, no, it's just like his ears get red when he's outside. And at first it was just getting really red and then it got redder and more irritated where there were a lot of spots and he would scratch and like scab and drew blood. So we had to put him in a cone for a little bit of time and it just has changed. He's always had like a runny nose when we go outside. He sneezes a bunch outside and then he started licking his paws a lot and then started scratching around his eyes a lot. And at first she, the vet gave us something after his surgery to say like maybe it's just something this antibiotic can kill and then it didn't and so in his soft cone he it could start he could like bend it and get to his eyes so I put him in his crate and he scratched again and he like around his eyes especially like in his folds was just like raw and bloody and so it's just not great most of the time I'm here with him and I keep my eyes on him and he doesn't have to have it on or he didn't have to have it on but now it's just like you can turn your back for one second and he could start scratching. And so we just put this one on so he can't reach his eyes. And it's been a couple of days and it is getting better. We did go to the vet this past Saturday and we got medicine. We have this whole new plan. Of we're doing like an exclusionary diet to see if it's his food, but also giving him medicine and antibiotics. And to, so we have a whole plan. So I just wanted you to know why he's back in the hard cone. Cause so many people praised me for putting him in the soft cone. And I wish I could keep him in that, but he has the ability to get to his eyes. And sometimes he'll wake up in the middle of the night and start scratching. So he has to have this on right now until we can get the issue under control. Another thing is going into the new year, obviously, this is my most successful series on my channel. And I'm proud of that. They take a lot of work to make it takes a lot of work to make these videos. So I'm glad that they get the most views. However, I want to get better. I want to change things. And I before kind of people send me stuff all the time, which is great. Keep doing that because I don't see everything, but I would feel the pressure to include every single thing everyone sent me, even if I didn't have a lot of information on the subject. And that led to Sometimes I regret what I put in a video because I feel like I didn't come off as informative as I would like and that I end up having to cut a lot of things out of videos because I have so much footage from trying to cover so many things in one video. Um, but I'm like, I don't want to put up an hour long video. Who's going to watch that also? I don't want to caption an hour long video and they still end up sometimes being like 40 minutes. So I'm going forward, going to be more selective on the things I choose to cover because it kind of started out with, you know, little petty dramas on Twitter. And to be honest, I still I still love those things and they're still going to happen. I'm still going to cover them if I want. But it also has morphed into me covering other things like 
um, the stuff with Disrupt Text and the article about publishing it. So I want this to be um, where you can get some fun popcorn drama, but also important issues that we can all benefit from to learn about. So I'm just going to be more selective. So if you send me something and I don't cover it, like don't feel offended. And also I may not cover it exactly when it happened because sometimes there's weeks where a bunch of things happen and I try to cram it into one video. So some things don't get discussed as much as I would, would like. And so I may have a bunch of things that happen this week, but it, some things may not come up to the next week because it already is a lot trying to do these weekly. And so when it's like eight different things trying to cram them into one video, it's just not the, the best. So this week I was writing down things and I was like, wow, I have all these things to talk about. Some things are big, some things are small and in between. And I was like, I'm just not going to do it to myself. It's very stressful and I don't think the quality comes out as much as I would like, like it to. So I'm going to cover a few things and then some things will roll over. I'm sure more, more things will happen, but I'm just going to, you know, essentially... That's the beauty of YouTube. This is my channel. I'm not working for anybody so I can decide what I cover, when I cover and how. And so I hope that you all are okay with that. I also, as a whole for my channel, want to get feedback um, going into the new year because I am feeling, I feel really grateful for my growth. And of course I want to continue to grow, um, but I wanna know if you have any input and I know I'm opening myself up to some really mean comments potentially, but I'm going to be <laughs> naive and positive that the majority of people um, are here because they enjoy my content and have constructive positive things to say. So I'm going to make like a Google survey, so it's anonymous, of questions about my channel, my content, things you like, maybe things you think I can improve on, things you don't like, to get a general consensus of what people like. And so obviously if there's like 50 people who say they like this thing and five people who don't, then obviously I'm gonna go with the people who do. But if there's certain things like, hey, I think your lighting isn't great, or sometimes I can't hear you, or things like that, I wanna fix those things. I want to improve, I'm obviously not perfect. And so I'm gonna link that down in the description below. Um, so please be kind, but I want constructive criticism. So if you have something, definitely let me know. And I think that's all I have to say. I've probably rambled on long enough now. So let's get started with this week. But first I would like to say that I'm still upset that Brewmate does not sponsor me. At least send me a free um, koozie thing. Shoot. Bebe has fallen asleep. So if you start to hear snores, it's him, it's not me. Okay, my laptop is here. I, I don't know if you can see it because this is kind of a different setup. This is my reading chair I normally have in the corner, but it's a little wider than my computer chair that I usually sit in and I need to make space for Nigel. I really want to get like a chair and a half that's wide enough where we can both sit in it and have space because I know people love having them in the videos. I love having him here. He loves it. So I'm working on that. But for now, I scooted this chair up. So I hope it's not awkward looking. But anyway, I'm going to be reading off my laptop because the first thing I'm starting with is this thread that I read on Twitter. I'm just going to go ahead and read it and you'll understand what it's about and I'll talk about it more after and finished. But the thread starts with, we need to talk about how the very white writing industry expects diverse authors to explain every cultural term in their books. Thread. The industry wants anything slightly diverse to be explained to the reader because it assumes the reader can't, one, look things up, two, wouldn't be from that culture. This places an unfair expectation on diverse authors. No one would expect white authors to write, as we prepared for the bridal shower, an event where people give gifts to a new mother, we stopped along the way at Starbucks, a local shop for coffee, to get drinks. This is because we're familiar with these things and we expect the audience to be familiar with these things. And we reward an ignorant audience when we expect a diverse author to write to the ignorant. We exclude other readers for whom the author's life is normal. When books that have Starbucks or battle showers are republished in other regions or countries, readers are expected to Google unfamiliar terms. They don't add lines to the book explaining what a Starbucks is. Books written by diverse authors do not need to be dictionaries for their cultures. It is not the author's job to explain their culture like it's a fantasy world or to teach away folks' ignorance. If a reader is ignorant of something, that's okay. But it is the reader's job, not the author's job, to go elsewhere and figure it out, like Google. 
Google is it exists. Don't expect books to be written to the barest level of familiarity. It infantizes the rest of the rest of us. A compromise to describe a potentially unknown term through prose that won't bore or infant infantize those already in the know. So if I say we picked up two coffees at Starbucks, you know, it's a coffee shop. I didn't have to say we stopped at Starbucks, which is a coffee shop. In conclusion, don't expect diverse authors to write for an ignorant reader. The reader's ignorance is not the author's fault or responsibility. Let authors write the story they want. And if some folks don't get it, not every story written for every reader anyhow. So that was an excellent thread. And there were a lot of great replies. Um, like someone said, yes, if it breaks the flow of the story to explain, I'm not explaining. As compromise in Bulgarian, we're very used to editor slash translator footnotes for things like that. Some people read them, others skip them. My favorite was one describing pumpkin pie as American Tikvinik. I don't know if I said that correctly. And they replied, I've read books with footnotes or cultural explanations in the back and I'm completely okay with them. I'm more in favor if the author is supported by publishing staff rather than expected to know stress over what's normal to them and wonder if it needs explaining. And someone else said it is unreasonable. Bur it's an unreasonable burden to place on marginalized authors. Even before the internet, we had libraries with a plethora of worldly knowledge. The inserted explanations detract from the flow of the narrative. And they replied, plus, you'll never be able to explain enough for everyone. It's an unfair burden for sure. And someone linked a NPR podcast that kind of talked about this, but I, um, I just thought that was really interesting because so this conversation isn't just related to books. It can be podcasts, like journal or magazine articles, stand up comedy. And it's usually a marginalized group that makes a cultural reference um, or something significant to their group that then has to be explained to the white majority. And I mean, it has a history. You can, in America specifically, go back to racism and white supremacy and all these things because white people were in control over black and brown people. And that has trickled down through time into um, white people are the majority in the country. And so their culture, their or their experiences, their stories, their media is the majority. It's what's popular. So most things that pertain to them or that are going to be included in the media they write and share and produce is going to be known to a majority of people. And no, I do not say all because there, nothing ever always applies to every single person, but a majority. And so it's usually a person, a marginalized group in their writing or in their stand up or whatever that says something. And if they have a white audience or part of their audience is white, they may not get it. So then some feel like they may have to explain these things. So um, our experiences aren't the norm. And that is not to say every marginalized group is a monolith. Every black person is not the same. Every brown person is not the same. Every person that is neurodiverse is not the same. But we often have shared experiences where a lot of things we experienced through our life are common, a phrase, a joke or something where you usually will get it. Again, not always. So it's not always okay to expect a person who is writing, who is not white, who is not neurotypical, who is not heterosexual to explain things all, like explain everything sometimes it may make sense sometimes it may they may be able to write it into the story um where it doesn't detract from the flow of their writing and sometimes i write books that have like a glossary in the back of terms um and that's nice too but they don't have to do that i i don't know how many books i've read where I've like highlighted a word or underlined a word and I've looked it up and written the definition in the book. Or if you're on a Kindle, you can highlight the word and literally get a definition. It's very easy that way and very helpful. And it's just increasing your vocabulary, increasing um, your knowledge overall. So the podcast is an NPR podcast called Code Switch and the episode I'll link down below. I use Apple Podcasts though so if you don't use that I'll also write out the title of the podcast so you can find it on whatever way you listen to a podcast. But the episode's called Sometimes Explain Always Complain Code Switch. So 
they talk about in the episode, but they, these two who do the podcast, they call it a, they call it the explanatory comma. So if I'm like talking and da 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 da, and I'm like, yeah, you know, Tupac, the prolific rapper from the West Coast who was killed, and da 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 da, you know, something like that. So that like comma where you have to explain something um, after you say it, but. To an audience, if you're talking to a certain demographic of people, are gonna be like, yeah, duh, I know who Tupac is. But then if other people, mainly maybe an older white group of people are listening, wouldn't know, they'd be like, oh, okay. So it's very, the podcast, it's, it's only like 26 minutes, which is a really great episode because they're like walking. It's kind of complicated because it's frustrating that you have to explain these things because you want, you don't want to alienate listeners or in a, in a case of a book, you don't want to, you don't want to alienate readers, but you also normally have a group in mind that you're talking to. So you don't want to have to keep explaining things when you're like, the people I know I'm talking to know what this means. So they were just talking about when they decide to do it, when they don't decide to do it. People who've been upset were like, I didn't know what that meant or you needed to explain it. And then people on the other side who are like, I'm getting annoyed that you keep explaining these things and I know what you're talking about. So I, it's very frustrating and I understand I could, I can imagine as a writer, especially if you're writing something that's a very culturally significant piece and people complaining, it's just like when people read stories um, outside of their own group or, you know, their race, ethnicity, and they're like, I don't understand, or I didn't like this, this, or this. And it's because for the most part, it wasn't written for you. So if you go into a reading, you need to know that. And if you don't understand things, you can Google them. You can read or watch own voices review and that would make more sense um, to you. It's it's not hard and not the, that doesn't mean that you cannot not like a book that's written by a marginalized person. That's not what that means. But a lot of people's reviews are about the parts that they didn't take the time to learn what it meant or to look up a word or to see why the author did it that way. If you don't like their style of writing or you know you didn't connect to a character or maybe the plot just wasn't for you, you can dislike a book by a marginalized author, but you need to be careful about what you say about that book because a lot of times it comes off as this very like white Eurocentric lens that people look at stories with and they're like, well, I just didn't get it. Or this, I couldn't relate to the person because they weren't white or something like that. Not like anyone says that explicitly, or maybe they do, but for people like me, I mean, I grew up reading majority white stories and I had favorite stories. I had characters that were my favorite or related to, or I related to for other reasons, but you know, despite skin color. And so that's what black and brown people have had to do for years or queer people find stories that they can find solace in or relate to characters or whatever in, even if those characters weren't exactly like them. So the uh, to go the other way around, I don't know why it's so complicated for, you know, a white typical reader to relate to a story where the character doesn't look exactly like them. It's not that hard, but this is all to say that I loved that thread and I thought it was a great, um, they made great points. So just try to keep an open mind when you're reading stories by different people different than yourself and to use the resources that you have um, on hand and being part of the book community, which I'm assuming you are if you're watching this video, that is the beauty of YouTube and of Goodreads, of blogs where people write reviews, own voices reviews. People say this all the time, but it's true. Google is free. There's so much information on the internet and think before you type out something that's just really woefully ignorant because you didn't, you didn't understand. You can take time after you finish a book, after you finish a movie or something that's different and you can take time to process it. You don't have to automatically hop on the internet and type out your feelings. You can take time. You can go, sometimes I finish a book and I don't know how I feel. I read reviews, I listen, I see other people explain things maybe I didn't get and I'm like, oh, okay. That's just my opinion. I don't think you have to finish a book and automatically know how you feel. You can sit with it. You can do a little research and uh, really process your feelings before you, you know, go put it on the internet if you're a reviewer. So I hope that made sense. I feel like, <laughs> For a little while it was kind of convoluted, but I will link that thread down below as well as the podcast, which I think is worth listening to. And I definitely am going to listen to more episodes of this podcast because I didn't know it exists. But um, 
yeah, the explanatory comma. Very interesting. So a few weeks ago in a video, I talk about I talked about disrupt text, which was a movement started by some educators um, to challenge the narrative, the curriculums in the United States to incorporate more modern text, more diverse text. And people are not happy about it. So that was in related to the Jess, Jessica Clewis rant on Twitter. She's a young adult author and one of the educators um, tweeted that, you know, a lot of t classics that are taught were written before like the 1950s and just think about how the United States was at that time and those ideals are in those books. And Jessica Clewis lost it and went on this rampage of t on Twitter of these just horrendous tweets. I'll link the video down below if you didn't watch it. And just what got really upset and really made Disrupt Tech sound like what it wasn't. So someone else is all in their feelings and her name is Megan Cox Gurdon. And she wrote a piece for the Wall Street Journal. It's titled, Even Homer Gets Mobbed. <sighs> so the first line you can see of the article says, a Massachusetts school has banned the Odyssey. And what's just shocking to me after you after you hear what she said and people who agree with her said, it's just like, are we not taking the time to read? Because if you took the time to read what Disrupt Text is actually about, you would realize all of the lies that are in your article. But I'll get to that. So for some reason, I can't read the full article from my laptop, but I could from my phone. But I got I have um, quotes from it anyway. It's not that long of an article. So it, st it starts out with here's her opening part. A sustained effort is underway to deny children access to literature under the slogan disrupt text, critical theory ideologues and Twitter agitators are purging and propagandizing against classic texts, everything from Homer to F. Scott Fitzgerald to Dr. Seuss. Okay, let's go back through that. They said to deny children access to literature, literally the opposite of what disrupt text is about. Who is denying anyone access to literature? And that to me says that they don't see books outside of like the typical canon, the traditional classics literature, which is a bunch of bullshit. Then they said Twitter agitators like ma'am, please purging. No one is purging classic text. They literally are just saying maybe you also incorporate something that's more modern. Look, they, I keep seeing this argument that they're trying to ban or get rid of or erase classic work and that's literally not what they're doing. They're just like, hey, those were written a long time ago. The world has changed. Maybe we should incorporate, that's a key word, incorporate, not ban, incorporate newer text um, into what we're teaching. Some things that may be more relatable for students in the year of our Lord 2021. Sorry. <laughs> it's getting me annoyed. Um, and so she talks about that and how it's, you know, going to lead to a, um, a society, a generation of le basically illiterate children. And I'm like, what are you fucking talking about? She has a quote from a science fiction writer I've never heard of, um, whose name is John Del Arroz, who defended Jessica Clewis on Twitter. And he said, erasing the history of great works only limits the ability of children to become literate. What? Hmm. This almost reminds me of the S.C. Hinton comment where she didn't want her book to be turned into a graphic novel because her book, The Outsiders, is, some, is the book a lot of children read, like the first book. And I'm like, in what world are you living in? Who is reading out The Outsiders as their first book? Nobody. And so he said, erasing the history of great works only limits the ability of children to become literate. Are you fucking kidding me? I've got, I would pull, I, they're saying if kids read giraffes can't dance, they won't learn words because there's words in here. Okay, look, there's words. Reading leads to literacy. I don't, what? That doesn't make any that doesn't make any sense. No one is starting off learning to read with great expectations. No one, okay? I I just really don't understand if they're hearing themselves. He's apparently a writer 
what? I, I don't get it. I don't get how people who are supposed to be educated people are so dumb. And I'm sorry, that's, he's dumb. That's stupid. I do not like that. Um, and of course, she says, he's right. If there is harm in classic literature, it comes from not teaching it. Students excused from reading foundation texts may imagine themselves lucky to get away with young adult novels instead. That's what the disrupts text people want. But compared with their better educated peers, they will suffer a poverty of language and cultural reference. Worse, they won't even know it. There's so much, there's so much to unpack here. If there is a if there is harm in classic literature, it comes from not teaching it. We will be okay. And again, that's not even what they're saying. No one is saying to stop teaching the classics. No one. Or me, maybe somebody, but not disrupt text. That's not what they're saying. And then she said, students excused from reading foundation texts may imagine themselves lucky to get away with YA novels instead. Now you're shitting on young adult novels. Also not cool. There are so many, especially in the last few years, amazing um young adult novels that tackle so many important cultural topics that are relevant now that are relevant now oh my god he said that's what the disrupt text people want but compared with their better educated peers they will suffer a poverty of language and cultural reference worse they won't even know it so they're saying that if you if you don't study classics you won't be you will be not as educated as your peers who do learn and you won't even you won't even know it because you're so dumb basically if you don't read the classics you're gonna be so dumb you won't even know it i i wish this was tequila because garbage the entire take is so trash um and again in the article the school didn't even ban the odyssey it was a teacher saying they were removing it from the curriculum literally read i don't understand how these people do not know how to read right now i can't get access to the screenshots that i had but when i go downstairs to edit this i will edit in some of the replies now it's in the wall street journal i do not subscribe to the wall street journal i have never read anything on the wall street journal so of course a lot of people in the replies i'm assuming are older some of them did mention that in their comments, but their comments were ridiculous. They're like, might as well burn books. Who said that? This one right here, those that don't know history are apt to repeat it. No one is talking about not reading nonfiction, bro. We're talking about reading the freaking Odyssey. Like, who's repeating that? Nobody, because it didn't happen. Susan, girl, bye. No one is ignoring history. You're just being ridiculous. I, I honestly can't deal with these people. Yes, Sterling, why not just jump all the way there? If you can't read it, just burn it. What kind of dumbass logic is this? Literally, oh my God, I just don't understand why these people can't read. Okay, sit down. Boo, -boo sit down. Sit down, please. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Then there was this thread that one of the educators shared and this dude named Martin tagged someone and said, are you following the disrupt text crusade? And they're like, I should, eh? And he said, we are deep into the territory of a cultural purge. And so Martin says, so disrupt text is gaining traction and claiming we believe Shakespeare, like any other playwright, no more and no less has literary merit. So they propose to replace it with Anti-Racist Baby by Kendi. No, not joking. These people should not be anywhere near children. Said one, so a short reflection. We read Homer to understand not just Homer, but every one of the generations that read Homer. Homer and the canon is our inheritance. For better and worse, the canon is who we are. Who is we? Who is we when we're talking about Homer? Um, I think there was a number two, but it goes right to number three. Maybe, maybe he forgot number two. Said the replacement of the canon by a ragtag collection amounts the production of a counterfeit. 
When you replace Homer with Yoon, whoever that might be, you are endorsing Yoon over Homer, and this opens a question about the fitness of the activist to judge. We ought to recognize that what Disrupt Text intends to do is rob American children of their cultural heritage and offer a counterfeit version more suitable to the ideological taste of its members. That is an intellectual crime and a project of cultural devastation. Okay, so I also clicked on this person's profile and he's from Germany, so I really don't even know what why he's in this conversation. But he really said, when you replace Homer with Yoon, you are endorsing Yoon over Homer. And I think he's talking about David Yoon or Nicola Yoon. Okay, I found this in my screenshots that Penguin um, School and Library tweeted that they were honored and proud to have partnered with the brilliant Disrupt Text on this educator guide. Take a look to see how you can use these eight titles by, by POC creators in your class. And so it included a book, Frankly in Love by David Yoon, and then one by Jacqueline Woodson, and let's see, Gabby Rivera. So he's referring to David Yoon when he was saying replacing Homer with Yoon. Um, and then saying that when we disrupt text intends to rob american children of their cultural cultural heritage so you're talking about their european heritage which is rooted in racism is that what we're robbing them of great thank you i <laughs> an intellectual crime and a project of cultural devastation I really do not understand what Martin is talking about here. And then he said, then there is a question, is the intellectual development of children to be entrusted to those who fail to understand the place and function of the canon? Should school teachers be re redrawing to their ideological tastes the cultural inheritance of the nation? What? And what, are, what did they even say that? Again, with this canon, like if you love it so much, great for you, read the classics, only read the classics, a wonderful. Uh, but there is more than the classics are some I am not a big fan of the classics but I haven't read that many the ones I had to read in high school I'm mostly spark note I'm not lying but um I know a lot of people who love classics still and they read other things you can <laughs> again they're not saying to get rid of the classics I'm sorry I'm just getting really infuriated but also um a lot of people are put off from reading, from being forced to read classics. There's just so many other books that can be offered, that can be, again, incorporated into the curriculum, things that are more modern, even still more modern than like the 1800s, things like Toni Morrison and Alice Walker and James Baldwin. And still, those aren't right now, but they're still diverse texts. We need more than the canon, okay? Yeah, the canon existed and it was predominant around white, heterosexual men or women. And we need diverse stories from black people, brown people, queer people. We need different stories so that kids can see things that they relate to so they can get something that's more similar to their experience and not read about old girl and her big petticoat I don't know walking to the general store to buy a piece of candy for a penny I just ah uh, these uh, these people are just so ridiculous um who I don't know if you hear my stomach growl. I'm hungry. He keeps going on all this other mess, but um, Lorena in response said, Here's, here begins a thread that wonderfully exemplifies what it is to woefully misrepresent our movement and message, as will express deep bias to the point that they can't even see it. It's so ridiculous. Um, she also had in her, I was going to say her stories, in her Twitter fleets, a great summarization of her response to this back this hate and I'm going to insert it because it's better than me summarizing it first of all I want to say thank you to everyone who has been supporting me that's been supporting disrupt text that has reached out via dms via text messages via emails posts on social media throughout um, and certainly all the people that are tweeting out their support and posting about their support to us. And I also want to say this is my first fleet ever, or whatever this is called. Yeah, this is a fleet. Um, but more importantly, um, 
I also want to say a couple things about the matter at hand. Demanding that teachers and districts and department chairs actually um, use more inclusive book lists is not racist. It is not banning classics. All of that uh, serves to simply minimize our movement, which allows people to make us really easy targets. Our movement and what we're talking about and what I push for is much more complex and nuanced. T uh, selecting books, teaching young people is much more complicated than here's my list of 10 books or six books or four books that I teach a year and I'm gonna do this for the next 14 years regardless of who's sitting in front of me, right? That's actually, that's, that's not productive. That is not meeting the needs of the young people in front of you. So if inclusivity, right, of these books and of these voices and of these people groups and of these topics and these ideas that the books bring feels like exclusivity to you, then that's something for you to interrogate. That's something for you to think about. Why is it that if these books are not present or some of them are simply replaced for a period of time, like why do I get so all up in my feelings about it? Why do I get so tight up in my chest? What is it that you need? What is the problem? Why do you have to be centered all the time and in all ways? And I, I really, you know, um, what I'm feeling right now at the end of this year, 2020, um, you know, even though I do have some concerns, I will say that I most certainly feel a conviction more and more that everything that we're talking about, everything that we're teaching and pushing teachers to do and all the things that we tweet and we write about are right and that we're going to be on the right side of history. So, uh, you know, I'm not going to stop. We're not going to stop. Uh, we, I don't know that we've hit even the middle ground of all the work that we're about to be doing and accomplishing. So people need to get ready and comfortable to be in this fight for the long haul. Uh, we, we are not done. Um, there is so much more work to do. And so looking forward to 2021, looking forward to it because there's so much more and change is coming. It's been coming and it's, some of it is here. So onward, especially, as, especially to all of our disruptors. We appreciate you. Um, we love you. We are here to work with you. Um, and, and we really appreciate the way that you all have been open and willing to engage with these ideas and apply what works for you and your students. That's all we can ask for, right? That's how we're going to make this nation better. Also, she received this disgusting email, so just warning for some really terrible language. And the email subject is all you vile Marxists brainwashing our children deserve to be lynched. It says you, the email is conservative justice warrior at mail.com. It says you are the real racist. You're you Marxist BLM black lives matter subhuman in word trash are now banning classic works like Shakespeare and Homer because they were created by white men. We need to bring back the KKK and start eradicating you filthy third world commie cretins. Two plus two equals four. There are only two genders. Facts don't care about your feelings, commie, inward, ape, gun emojis. P.S. I hope your family is having a merry time for the holidays. Wink emoji. I don't know what else there is to say besides... That's just awful to read. And that wasn't even like directed at me. But when people love to say that racism that doesn't exist anymore and I don't see color and this is just, this is what someone who's just trying to educate to be more, um, have stories that are more relatable to kids. This is the kind of hate that she gets. And it's really, whoo, I'm mad. <laughs> it's just really infuriating honestly at this point because um, it's like when is it not going to be an uphill battle against the majority the racist not saying the majority is racist but when is it not going to be when will we be able to stop fighting is my question and I was talking to Andrew and I was like I wonder if um I don't I'm not hopeful that we'll see significant change in my lifetime. And that's really depressing. So while this conversation about Disrupt Text is mainly about books, it's, it's bigger than that because all of the people who are mad about it 
are really just showing how racist they are and only care about their white stories being at the forefront and the center of everything. <sighs> so, um, I would say I would link to that wa um, wa Wall Street Journal article, but I'm not because you could go find it if you want and it's honestly not worth your time to read. It's very brief though. And I, yeah, it's upsetting, but I'm, <laughs> Ooh, I'm just going to go ahead and move past that. But I just want to talk about that. And again, I love what Disrupt Text is doing. Um, one of the tweets from Disrupt Text, I'm just going to share. And it said, more than... More than a year and a half ago, our team came together and asked ourselves what could be more helpful for teachers as they develop a more intentional, culturally responsive, and anti-racist literary practice. And based on our work with kids, we arrived at these core principles. One, continuously interrogate our own biases and how they inform our thinking. Two, center Black, Indigenous, and voices of color in literature. Three, apply a critical literacy lens to our teaching practices. And four, work in community with other anti-racist educators, especially Black, Indigenous, and other educators of color. And nowhere in those core principles does it say to ban books written by white people. It doesn't say that. So, um, yeah, I think I've talked about that enough, so I'm just going to go ahead and move on. Oh, wait, I wanted to add this quote by one of my favorite people on Twitter. It was Clint Smith. And he said, the best teachers I know teach their students to critically interrogate every text they read. They teach both Morrison and Shakespeare, Baldwin and Frost, contemporary YA and 19th century novels. They reject the idea that they are mutually exclusive. They build and imagine a new canon. That's literally the point of Disrupt Text. Literally. So obviously in the book community world, we know that almost everything is cyclical. So a conversation that came around again this year was the discourse between independent bookstores versus like Barnes and Noble. So the first tech tweet I saw was by Christian Vega that said not to cause discourse, but the idea of always indie bookstores when people shop at Barnes and Noble is flawed because not everyone has a local store easy, easily accessible to them. And frankly, not all indies are nice and welcoming to all. The illusion is there, but that's not reality. And so I wanted to discuss this because I know in my videos, I always encourage people to shop a local shop indie if they can. Um, I am an affiliate with bookshop.org, which is where you can shop independent bookstores online. And I wanted to bring this up because I know, um, well, this conversation always comes up and the conversation with Amazon and accessibility. And so I just wanted to touch on that really quickly because I don't ever want to come off as if you don't have access to certain things, then you're wrong or less than or, you know, anything negative. I simply want to provide options for those who are able. If you, you know, maybe you're like, yeah, I'd like to not always buy from Amazon, but I don't feel like looking up where, or I don't think this place ships to me. So I provide those links, I mention them for those who can't. I understand that not everyone has a local independent bookstore. Store. I mean, growing up, the we had a Barnes Noble and a Books A Million. I used to go to a Books A Million when I got books. Um, and so I didn't start going to like an independent bookstore until I was an adult. Um, a lot of places don't have like, even half price books is great, but I didn't have one of those till I moved to Washington. So I just want to say that I'm not like anti everything else. I, I use Barnes and Noble here. I've ordered from Barnes and Noble. I've ordered from Books A Million. I myself want to, challenge myself that if I because I get primarily most of my books through the library if I don't already own them I borrow ebooks and audiobooks and then if I love it then I purchase it and I challenge myself to purchase those from an independent bookstore Barnes Noble Books a Million Blackwells in the UK um before I go to Amazon and it has helped me personally in book buying because I used to haul a lot of books a lot of them from Amazon because it was cheaper and but I'm saying that's for me personally and if you personally want to do that great here are some links to places where you can do that because 
you know, Amazon is this big monster, obviously, owned by Jeff Bagel Bozo. And Amazon owns Book Depository, which a lot of people in the United States use to get UK copies of books or people, they have free shipping worldwide. And so I per like Blackwells, if you live in the United States, Blackwells has free shipping to the US for books from the United Kingdom, which is a big thing because shipping from the UK to the US is a bitch. So again, I just wanted to bring that up because everyone does not have equal access. People in different countries may not have local bookstores or bookstores that carry all the books they want or books that have been translated. And so Amazon is the way for them to get books. And I get that. So I just don't want what I say to be construed and make you feel less than if you don't support independent in bookstores. I understand if you can't. I'm just saying if you can, if you want to, if that's something you're interested in doing, um, because for me, it also has become helpful because it is more expensive to buy from an independent bookstore. Um, you know, you're paying for shipping. The books are priced higher, but that's because they can't afford to sell them at a loss like Amazon can because Amazon has more than just books. So for me, that has lowered the amount of books I have acquired. I mean, I still have acquired some and I am happy with that. But again, I say I and me because these are things I do. And so I'm not going to say that I'm trying to spend less from Amazon and I book, buy my books from an independent bookstore or I support Barnes and Noble and, and Books a Million and then link an Amazon wish list in my profile or use Amazon. I'm going to say, this is what I do. And so I'm gonna share links that I use. Does that make sense? So I just wanted to bring that up because it is going around on Twitter. Everybody does not have equal access to different things. Everyone doesn't have a library. And so we can't shame people for what they do. And maybe people buy books off Amazon because they are cheaper and that's what they can afford. And it's really, <laughs> it's really capitalism's fault, okay, for everything. So I just wanted to bring that up and um, yes, so. That's it on that. And honestly, I had something else on my list for today, but I have overwhelmed myself <laughs> getting angry about Disrupt Text and I'm very hungry. So I'm gonna wrap that up. I mean, I have more, but it's just gonna have to wait till next week because these videos are very exhausting um, to prep for and film and edit, you know, trying to include everything. And I'm not saying that to complain or for anyone to feel sorry for me. These are just new things that I'm doing so I don't get burnt out from doing these videos because I do enjoy them. I love putting them up and I love the comments that I get. So this is just me going forward, trying to figure out what's gonna work best for me so that I can bring you content, but be proud of it and um, you know be able to look back on it without cringing because I have done that at some videos. But that's it for today. So of course I'd love to hear your opinion on anything mentioned here. And always feel free to, if I didn't cover something, to mention it because maybe I didn't see it on Twitter and I can look into it. But as always, please check out my description. I've always got links to um, what I talk about in the video, links to things that are going on currently. I do have links to like bookshop.org that I'm an affiliate with or Libro FM, which is an alternative in the United States to Audible because I don't think they work outside of the United States. But thank you for watching. If you have made it to the end, I know this has been very wordy, very long. <laughs> what, when do I make a short video? When I have a video that's under 20 minutes, I literally jump for joy. But if you did like this video, if you could give it a thumbs up and please subscribe because there's going to be a lot of content coming, especially this month. I've got to get out my, all my 20, my end of the year content, my best, worst, disappointing, surprising. I've got a lot coming out. And I hope you will join me for all of that mess, all my shenanigans, and I'll see you in my next one. Bye.